title of my talk is basically 10 commandments for efficiency as architecture and you might have noticed the star on the 10 and that says conditions apply which will know uh, you'll uh, know that soon why it's there so let me start by introducing myself my name is Kushagar Gaur and uh, I'm if known I'm better known as Chen Chang on web and I'm from India now just to clarify, India is not just a land of snakes and tigers. We recently started writing CSS also. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm a front-end developer, by my, uh, it's my day job, and I work at a wonderful startup called Wingify. So we basically develop an AV testing tool called Visual Website Optimizer that I work on. And uh, in case you have already heard about me, it is probably due to my open source projects. Uh, one of which is hint.css, it's basically a CSS tooltip library. And the second one is a pixel art that lets you create pixel art using CSS. All right, so what is this talk gonna be about? Uh, so I've been uh, doing front end stuff for almost three years now. And like we all do, I have learned a lot about issues we face in CSS and uh, uh, many solutions that we can uh, use to prevent them and avoid them. So uh, this is gonna be about those CSS stuff that I would like to share with you from my experience. And uh, the target of this talk is to basically help us uh, know certain things which make the CSS architecture efficient. And by efficient, I mean two things over here. So uh, first, your CSS will be easy, should be easy to understand for you as well as anyone uh, new joining on your project. And also it should be easy to extend in future. So no more careless style sprinkling, which generally uh, tends to be in our apps. Also, uh, I'm a first time speaker at a conference and that was such a big conference and it's quite hard. Uh, and I'm not really good at speaking and making presentations. So uh, I, I'm basically added a game for some reason uh, because I'm good at making games. And uh, this is a game which we can all play together at the end of the talk. All right, so commandment number one. It says, uh, thy height shall remain greater than thy file size at all times. Uh, it simply means keep your file sizes small. But why? Why do we need to make our file sizes small? So first thing, it keep, helps to keep your code modular. And mod modular code basically means uh, whenever ne you need to add something or you need to change something, you can quickly search for it uh, at the, uh, you can search for the target spot. Uh, where in the code you actually need to place your CSS because uh, modularity will uh, easily enable you to figure out which file uh, or which module actually needs to be changed. So things become quite fast in uh, extensibility wise. And what do we need to do? It's a simple rule. Keep dividing and refactoring your files as and when they get too big. So you just need to stop at points in your development and see what uh, could be separated out into separate modules and just keep on doing it periodically. So uh, let's take a simple scenario. Uh, when you, you're starting a side project on the first day of Christmas, and obviously you start with a single CSS file, a style of CSS as that is commonly known for, uh, for a single file, and you place all your CSS in just a single file, right? and you quickly uh, recognize and apply the rule that uh, my style of CSS is getting bigger and I need to refactor it and separate it out into modules. So on the fourth day of Christmas, you realize that, and uh, this is a common scenario which applies to almost every app. So you could uh, separate your style.css file into, say, four separate files or modules. So base could have uh, styles pertaining to tags, uh, anchor tags and uh, other tags which need to have a basic style. Then there could be a helpers.css, which is basically helpers like uh, a for helper for floating elements left and right, or say uh, clearing floats. Then there could be a file called components.css, which could carry your components like buttons, drop downs, tabs, and all. Then uh, there could be an optional theme.css. Let's say you have your uh, site which renders in a blue theme, and, and uh, also there's a red theme, so maybe you could have theme.css as well. And if you're having, uh, if you're using a preprocessor or like SAS, you might as well have a file called mixins.scss, which has your mixins. Further, on the eighth day of Christmas, you realize that your components.scss again got bigger. 
uh, it has a lot of components in it. So again, you apply the same rule. You basically divide it and refactor it into separate modules. So your component.css now can become a folder, basically, components. And it can have files like buttons.css, dropdown.css, basically every component divided into a separate file. And if you follow this approach, most probably you will be happy on the 12th day of Christmas. Okay, commandment number two. Thy code config shall remain at one place. And this basically means use variables. Now this is uh, uh, related to a preprocessor, uh, I mean a preprocessor, because this won't work in CSS currently. But the good news is that variables are uh, um, arriving in C native CSS in future as well. So uh, you can always use that in CSS also. So let's take a sample layout. So this is a, a very common layout in to, uh, apps today. So basically you have a header, sidebar, and content. So header is something that spans full width, and it has a height of 50 pixel. Then you have a sidebar that spans the complete height and a width, fixed width, and it's obviously starting from the uh, bottom of header. Then there's content, which is below the header and alongside the sidebar. Now if you notice here, there are too many magic numbers, and uh, these are hard-coded numbers which should be avoided, and we'll see why. So con consider this approach. Uh, what basically uh, I have done is I've separated those hard-coded magic numbers into separate uh, into variables, right? So I have a variable called head header height, which is 50 pixels, and a sidebar width. So what I'm doing right now is instead of uh, using those hard-coded numbers in my code, I'm actually using those variables. So uh, why is this better? First of all, it's less error prone. So we have uh, we have minimized the chance of making mistakes. So if I was using those hard-coded numbers, I, I might at some place use wrong values. Instead of 10, I might use 20 or so, uh, likewise. So uh, we have potentially minimized the error here. And the second thing is easy extensibility in future. Why extensibility? Because uh, let's say uh, this probably applies to early stages of development where you need to tweak things very quickly and see how it goes. So uh, with this approach, you can basically tweak the variables instead of modifying the values at every place in the code. And you can uh, very quickly see uh, how the result is and decide on the values and fix on them. OK, commandment number three. Thou shalt believe in abstractions. This simply means component abstraction. OK, so uh, let's take this example where you have a game and you're developing this in uh, HTML5 just because you can nowadays. And uh, you're basically styling the complete uh, screen of the game and uh, specifically the HUD elements you see. So let's take the example of the one you see at the bottom uh, left and the top right. So your code might look probably look like this. You have a class for the stats HUD element called, let's say it's a class called HUD stats. So, uh, it's a fixed position element on the screen, and it has some opacity and filter to just to give it a hard feel. And obviously, we position it uh, using the bottom, bottom and left. Similarly, for the map hard element, so uh, it's going to be same. It's a fixed position element, the same filtering, and obviously the top and right uh, properties to just to position it. Now, if you notice here, the first three properties in both the rules are exactly the same, and this is repetition. And uh, we all know repetition is bad. It's uh, a common issue of, uh, common reason for issues that you face in your uh, applications. So we should not repeat it. So this is a different approach. What we have done here is we have separated out those three properties into a separate class. And it's called HUD element. And now HUD stats and HUD map, which were our initial classes, are just left with the positioning styles. And actually, these st uh, styles which were different for those classes. And the usage is simple. So we have a HTML element. Now the thing is that both the classes need to be applied so that we get these styles from both the classes. So this can be improved further. Let's say we are using a preprocessor. So uh, there's something called, uh, specifically in SAT, there's something called placeholders. So uh, the difference in, uh, from the previous slide is that we now define a placeholder instead of a class. 
which basically defines uh, fic uh, the, those properties which are common in those HUD elements. And instead of uh, basically using that placeholder, we extend our current classes with that. Right. So what it enables is basically HUD stats and HUD map classes are now extended with the HUD element placeholders. And now I can simply use the individual class in my HTML. I don't have to repeat the two classes. So no repetition here, clean code, less chances of error. Right. Commandment number four, thou shalt sp spread peace and stop thy selectors from fighting. Any guesses for this? Nope. Keep selector strength low. So uh, selectors have strengths and they do fight. We have all seen this in Christian stock. So uh, selectors have something called as specificity, uh, which determines the strength of those selectors. And they do conflict with each other. Let's take a simple example. Let's say we have a component of tabs in our app. And for some reason, a developer styled it using div.tabs. And it was being used in the HTML, where we simply put the class. Now, another developer joined the project, and he, he was required to make a variation of the tab component, which instead of having a full width, which initial class has, it was required to have a half width, 50% width. So he went ahead and made a separate class for that, tabs half, and gave it a property width 50%. And this was uh, meant to be used with, along with the tabs class. So this is a simple uh, common usage, how he would go about, have the tabs class on the element, and Along with it, he has the tabs half. Now, this won't work. And the reason is simple. The strength of the first selector, which is div.tabs, is basically greater than the selector defined uh, after it, which is tabs half. And the reason is because of concatenation. So concatenation of the actual tag with the class increases its strength. And hence, uh, the second class is not able to override the properties of first class. So things can get a lot messier from here. So a probable solution is you, again, prefix your class name with the div tag just to make your selectors equal with the first one and able to override the first one, right? Or you could go the better way, not important. Plus, we have another problem now. The tabs can only be used on the with, along with the div tag. So it's, uh, it is fine, but uh, it's an unnecessary unnecessary restriction you have uh, put on your selector that uh, even in future if we decide to have the tab class on some other element, this won't work, it would break. So the solution is simple here. Uh, there was no need to concatenate the tab component, the tab class with div. We could simply have dot tabs and this would be solved. So the key thing is just keep your selectors low. Don't put unnecessary nesting, don't put unnecessary concatenation because that would just make things worse. Okay, over to commandment number five. Thou shalt treat your classes as thy own children. Name them with equal love. Which is basically naming convention. Okay, so uh, naming is very important in CSS, I feel. And when I say it's important in CSS, I, I actually mean not in CSS itself, but in comparison to other languages. Because if you see in other languages, uh, if your variable names are not correct, they don't make sense. They are not. Uh, I mean, they are not good. Nothing would break. Your code will still function. Everything will work fine. But CSS has some bad things in it, uh, like the earlier commandment we saw: uh, selector strengths, selector specificity. So these things are uh, something which can be avoided if we incorporate a very good naming system in our CSS. And that is why I say it is very important in CSS. So uh, BEM is something I'm gonna talk about uh, as a naming convention. So BEM basically uh, is a methodology to uh, not to name things, but instead uh, to separate out components from your app. So it, it basically supports component abstraction. So BEM stands for block element and modifier. So what it says that uh, in your app, you uh, uh, most probably have things which are independent uh, independent components, things which could be separated out into modules and could be used uh, anywhere independently. 
So uh, BEM cons uh, terms them as block. So block is basically a component you have in your app. Then there is something called element. So element is sub parts of your component. A component might have uh, several things which act, uh, eventually build up to the component. So those are called elements. Then finally there is modifier. A component might have variations which BEM terms as modifier. So this is the methodology part of BEM. But this is uh, augmented with a naming convention as well. So the naming convention I have shown here is basically a variation of actual thing which was developed at Yandex. So it's a, a variation by Nicholas and Harry Roberts. So uh, what we translate this into is a block is always a single class, rule number one. So let's say we have a class called component. So block is a component. Then there's an element class. So element class, according to this rule, is basically uh, prefixing uh, with the actual component name and uh, double underscores. And lastly, we have the modifier, which is uh, whose name we get by prefixing component name and then double hyphens. So this is the naming convention we follow for all the three elements, three parts of PEM. Now let's see how this applies actually and why it's good. So let's take an example of a component because BEM basically uh, works on component. We have a slider in our app and uh, if, you were, if you were not to use BEM, this was the uh, probably the CSS you would have written. So we have the slider class which has a position relative. Then we have uh, two things uh, residing in the slider. So first is the slider track, so we write a CSS when the slider track is inside the slider, we give it a background. And similarly for the knob, right? And uh, you might as well have a variation of this slider, a variation in which we have an extra input to basically uh, manually let the user manually change the values. So for, for that, we might have uh, a selector like this. So uh, if you see here, we have lots of uh, so-called the bad things in CSS in our selectors. So the first first uh, selector is fine, but the second selector has nesting in it, the third as well, and uh, the last one is quite uh, terrible. So we have concatenation along with nesting, so that is really bad. So let's apply BEM on this example. So uh, if you were to use the same naming conventions uh, we just saw, this would actually translate into the component class being the same slider. The slider track uh, would be simply named as the component name, underscore, underscore, the actual element. So these are the elements, track and knob, so slider knob, track and slider knob. Then the variation. So variation would actually be uh, style like uh, slider hyphen hyphen with input. And whenever this variation class is basically on a component, we need to actually display the slider input, which is again an element of a component. So if you notice here, uh, first selector remains the same, but the second and third selector we have managed to remove the uh, nesting. So they are single classes now. Much better, much uniform, and less specific. And even in the last one, we uh, the nesting is still there, but concatenation has been removed, much better than the previous one. So uh, this is how BEM can be used to actually keep your selectors low. Uh, the target is to keep this, uh, every selector as just one class, wherever it works. Okay, commandment number six. Thou shalt not mix up thy ego and Z indexes. Z index management. So what's the issue with Z indexes? So uh, this is a common thing we see uh, in most of our apps. So uh, people tend to uh, set properties, uh, set the values of Z indexes properties like uh, 9999999. And the reason is simple. They don't know what might come over me. So why not set a max value? So the solution for this is basically uh, using the commandment number two, which we saw earlier, using variables and separating out your Z indexes into variables, right? So uh, let's say we have an app and it has uh, multiple components. So components like overlay, slide out, backdrop, then there is a slide out, there's a sidebar, navigation, header and stuff. So uh, first thing, we separate our Z indexes into variables, but that is not it. So what additional purpose this code is solving is 
it's basically translating your visual hierarchy, the actual layer system of your component into code. Now I, ha I have a linear uh, representation of your layers right in my code. What good, good is it? So uh, there are two things you could do with your components, in, in, uh, with your UI elements in an app. You could uh, change uh, the existing uh, layer position of those elements, or you might add new elements, UI elements to your app. So changing existing Z indexes become really easy because you actually know what might break. You actually know the what things come before me and what after me. And same with the Z, uh, while adding new elements to your app. You actually, you can uh, now actually visualize where my element fits in the layer system, right? So no more Z index 99999. You can keep your Z index short because now you know what's above me and what's below me. Okay, over to commandment number seven. Inheritance doesn't always gives you the money. So uh, this is again a, a SAS commandment and it basically uh, is about the add extend thing which SAS provides. So like you saw earlier, add extend is something which you can use to extend a current class with any previous class and the properties of that class which you actually extend would be um, carried over to your new class, right? So uh, add extend has a, a thing which it, which might uh, make your CSS very bad and I term it as selector hell. Let's see what it is. So uh, let's say in your app you have uh, an error class which is basically used to define things which any error in your app might have. So uh, your error should be uh, colored red and it might have a background, a reddish background. So anything which, is, which represents error would obviously be using this error class. Then there was a requirement to actually uh, increase the padding, let's say, of any error which is coming in the sidebar. So uh, we probably will have a style like that. Any error in the sidebar should be having a padding of 10 pixels. Now uh, consider we have a notification box and it's basically an error notification box. So what I would do is my error notification should extend with a error class, so I get the error properties on myself without actually writing the properties again. Now notice this. Uh, this is the compiled CSS of the SAS over here. And if you notice the highlighted selector is something which we did not want it and did not actually intentionally write, but it is being generated. And this is an unnecessary C uh, CSS. So this might look uh, not so much of concern right now, but if you, let's say you have a huge app of, with so many styles, this is something you could end up with. And uh, this is a real selector we had in our app. So the solution for this is basically using placeholders, which we earlier saw in component uh, abstraction commandment. So uh, what we're doing differently here is, First of all, the error class does not have the properties now. It's basically transferred into a placeholder. So we define a new placeholder called error, and that now has the properties of an error. Second rule, we never extend a class. We always extend a placeholder. So uh, error class is something that is to be used in the HTML. So we create the error class and then basically extend it with the placeholder. Similarly, we had the message notification so that is extending the error again. And rule number th three, whenever a class needs to be tweaked uh, based on some location or based on some anything, so we use class for that. And that you can see, so uh, while tweaking the pack padding of the error, error, we basically use the class there. And if you follow those three rules, you see that uh, that unnecessary CSS that was generated is no more there. And this actually helps reducing compilation time as well. And in our app, we were able to reduce it by 76% because SAS needs to do a lot of work to, uh, while compilation to actually see wh what is extending, being extended where in your code, and replace those instances. So it's a lot of work. 
this could really be of uh, quite a benefit. This is what that star meant. So uh, seven commandments is all I have. And uh, now I'll be actually switching over to the game which I was talking about. So this game is basically a MMO uh, CTG. So that's massively multiplayer online CSS throwing game. So if you could open this IP in your mobiles or uh, laptops, we could all play this together. So the thing here is, uh, I don't play this, you guys play it together. So if anything goes wrong, it is because of, because of you, not me. So uh, we are getting a count here, uh, the number of people who are getting connected to the uh, game. So nine people. Please don't start sending things. Let me explain what it does. Okay, so, uh, so this, uh, let's see uh, what we need to do here. So I'm starting a sample level here. Uh, level three is, guys, where's the code of conduct, please? So uh, this is level number three. It's quite hard, so I'm uh, using it as a demo level. So we have a player here, and that's a flag which we need to uh, basically get. And there's a block in between which we need to somehow remove, right? Now, all, uh, you guys, what you need to do is, uh, you, you all see a text box, right? It's all good. Um, so you'd see a text box where you need to put a pair, a property, or and a value, right? So uh, let's say display colon none, and you need to submit submit that, right? And uh, the thing here is, this is a sample scenario. Whatever rule you submit, whatever property and value you submit, is basically gonna apply uh, in an abstract way on this scenario. Not really getting applied uh, technically, but guys, you won't be able to play like this. So uh, can we try uh, submitting sensible solutions? <laughs> this is CSS conf, right? So uh, let me give you a hint here. So you all, uh, every one of you is basically in front of a table. And this is a border which is blocking. So if you are in front of a table and there's a border, how do you remove the border? solution something related to border and table okay so solution here was I guess nobody is making an current <laughs> attempt so the solution is basically a uh, border collapse collapse so if you do that it basically will disappear the Water. So let's try this, level one. So that's an enemy, it keeps on hitting us. Oh my god. So uh, you need to submit a, a property and a value pair that will basically somehow block this enemy from hitting us. Can we try this? Okay, I think I need to give a hint here as well. So you basically uh, need something in between the player and the enemy, uh, probably a block. So how do you display a block? Can we try submitting correct solutions? Vendor prefixes are not required. So uh, another thing which I forgot to mention is if 50% of the audience submits the correct solution, this level would get cleared. And out of 103, we just have 17 correct solutions. Come on, CSS lovers. I don't think we are going to reach 50% correct solutions. OK, solution for this is obvious. So, uh, people are sending display blocks. So 
assuming 50% audience was not doing funny stuff. Oopsie. So, open up. So we would have a block which would actually kill the enemy and level clear. So this is an interesting one. Last level from my side. Level two. So the player is on a platform and he needs to capture the flag but the issue is the platforms are not on same same level so i'm not able to get the flag so how do you get uh, something which has broken on the next line to actually get on the same level as the previous element come on not a single right solution Okay, uh, so the solution is basically white space, no wrap. So, and we clear it. Yep. That's it from my side. Thanks for listening. Hi. Um, in the f pretty much the beginning of your talk, you talked about keeping your files modular and small, right? Um, but you mentioned it's in CSS, and then you mentioned that you have, if you're using SAS, you should use a mix sense file for SAS. Right. Don't you think that if you're using SAS, you should keep small files, but then concatenate them into one CSS file um, when you deploy? So production is not really of a concern here. So it's a good practice even to get your all your styles into single CSS, so you don't have a uh, 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 I mean, multiple request, HTTP requests being sent from the browser. So that is a, something which is uh, fine. But the concern here is actually the, in the development process. So you, uh, you, why you need modularity is because you need to append things and change things over time, right? So splitting of files is necessary in uh, development, not in production, I guess. So this is uh, answer your question. Okay, I have uh, another small question. Sure. Um, you showed that you're um, separating it to files according to kind of the, the style of the components, like drop downs right. and stuff like that. Right. Don't you think that maybe also it would be good to separate it to the pages that you're using or the, the templates that are associated with most of these styles? Because a lot of times styles are associated more with the page they, they appear on and not with a specific component. Right. So, uh, so uh, writing styles pertaining to specific pages is something we all have been doing. Uh, for a long time now, uh, but the issue with that is uh, uh, it leads to basically a lot of repeated code, and uh, code gets uh, repeated on different pages, and uh, even though certain things are same on uh, all the pages, you still have repeated code. So the solution for this, which many people have started using, uh, is to have a different uh, outlook over this. So instead of styling things on specific pages again and again, you basically uh, what you do is uh, look out for things which are common in all the pages and separate them, them as components. So that is reason number one. I, have, I haven't I have included those page styles in the uh, sample solution I uh, just uh, showed. Uh, so uh, you basically should have components in your app rather than styling pages. But even if you have those specific page styling things, even if uh, there's a requirement, you can always have something called as a specific page section where you have uh, styles for your home page, your, for your about page, and stuff. OK, thanks. Um, hi. Um, actually, uh, I'm wondering about the point number five you mentioned about the, uh, instead of using the uh, nested uh, selector you try to prefix, and using the name convention using uh, underscore or dash dash. Right. And uh, I'm wondering if, if we make the code less reusable, because I mean, every time you need to prefix, uh, I mean, the, the name with some of the uh, of the class name, and I mean, uh, after a while, maybe the name will be uh, blow up and the, it become very long, and the code is less uh, reusable. So uh, I agree, these selectors do get uh, do tend to get longer if you uh, use the BEM convention, but I feel the extensibility and uh, the uh, and the reusability and the uh, thing that it uh, lets you avoid very of various things in CSS like selector sense and all is much more than just the names getting bigger. It doesn't really affect affect you. It's just a visual thing that you uh, see long selectors and that really scares you. So I guess the advantages are better 
more than the um, disadvantages in that case. Uh, hello, uh, great talk. Uh, what's, what do you think is the advantage of using placeholder uh, if you compare it to like uh, variables? So placeholder and variables are I guess two separate things. So variables can like in other languages store, uh, store values, right? They could be single decimal strings and maps and stuff. But placeholders on the other hand are something which is a group of properties just like classes are or any other rule is. So it's a group of property which you can extend. A variables is not something you can extend. Placeholders can be extended. Okay, I think that was really, really cool.